Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Nancy Proctor. I'm Chief Strategy Officer and Founding Director of The Peel, Baltimore's Community Museum. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this second talk in the 2024 It's More Than History Lecture Series, produced by the Baltimore National Heritage Area and presented by The Peel. Today's event features a presentation by Dr. Ida E. Jones, who will be speaking about educator and activist Victorine Quill Adams. Dr. Jones is the Morgan State Archivist and became intrigued with Victorine Adams during Morgan's sesquicentennial, I challenge you all to say that five times fast, sesquicentennial celebration in 2017. Dr. Jones is a consummate scholar who believes deeply in the words of Mary McLeod Bethune, who stated, power must walk hand in hand with humility and the intellect must have a soul. Today's online program is being recorded and the recording and transcript of the discussion will be available after the program on our YouTube channel in about a week. Now, during this presentation, please keep your, mukes, mute, your mics on mute until the end of the program when we will uh, open up the floor for questions. You can add your questions to the chat in this Zoom session at any time, and we'll try to answer them during the uh, Q&A session after the, the presentation. We have Shamika, uh, an ASL interpreter with us, uh, who will be interpreting the entire discussion and chat. Thank you very much, Shamika. You can also turn on closed captions in your Zoom toolbar. I'd like to add that accessibility is a core value at the Peel, so you will find almost all of our programs are ASL interpreted and captioned, so please tell your friends. Our aim is to be accessible to all. <clears throat> The Peel's mission is about amplifying and sharing the voices and stories that too often have been overlooked or intentionally erased from the historical record. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Peel in Baltimore stands on the traditional ancestral lands of a number of indigenous peoples, including the Piscataway and the Susquehannock. Our work is ongoing to better understand the pre-colonial history of our city and region, and also to support the indigenous peoples who are part of our communities today. I'd like to thank Ryan Coons and the Maryland State Arts Council for the land acknowledgement references they've made available to us, and to local leaders like Ashley Minner Jones for ensuring that indigenous voices are heard and recognized in Baltimore today. You can pick up your free copy of the Illustrated Guide to East Baltimore's Historic American Indian Reservation Walking Tour map from the Peel, and also download the Guide to Indigenous Baltimore, uh, uh, the app, for free. Um, you can go ahead and sign up for the next lecture in this series, which will be held on April 12th on the Peel's website. And while you're there, check out the Candlelight Concert we'll be hosting the, on Saturday, April 7th, um, and other upcoming programs, both online and at the Peel, that you might enjoy. Now, I'm happy to introduce Shante Daniels, Executive Director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Shante, thank you for once again allowing the Peel to present the compelling and excite, insightful talks that are always part of the It's More Than History lunch, Lunchtime Lecture Series. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Baltimore National Heritage Area is um, always delighted to bring these programs to our community and beyond. Um, Baltimore is a place of um, famous people, famous places, and famous events that have um, created our national history, um, contributed to our history. So it's really important that we continue to bring these uh, stories to you. Um, I've known Dr. Jones for uh, quite some time and Dr. Jones is, has just been a real friend of the heritage area in her work at Morgan State University. So I'm not gonna go back into her bio, but I will tell you um, she is currently the co-president of the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites. She's a board member of the Maryland Women's um, Heritage Center um, Advisory Board for the National Women's Suffrage um, National Monument Foundation. And um, just based upon that, I would like to tell everybody about an event which is connected to the Women's um, um, Heritage Center that is coming up soon. They are going to be going to New York 
um, to see the, um, the stage play SUFFS, S-U-F-F-S, on April 28th. It is $185 and it's a round trip bus coach to uh, New York City with breakfast. And I'm sure they will introduce you to more history of the women's suffrage movement. So with that, I'd like to turn over this program to my friend and our colleague, Dr. Ida E. Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Shante as well as the Peel Museum, Nancy and, and staff. Thank you so very much for having me. I will share my screen here and we will get started on our discussion about a, an endearing person I have come to grow to like posthumously, uh, Victorine Q. Adams. So the talk for the day is uh, speaking truth to power in and for community. And I, I see in the audience a number of friends who are a Baltimore resident or Baltimore affiliate or Maryland native, so or neo native, so I look forward to a hearty discussion. The presentation will explore three areas for her life uh, Victorine E. Quill and the Baltimore, which she was conceived and grew up in, then who was Victorine Q. Adams, and then her legacy in Baltimore. And as you've heard a number of times, I'm at Morgan State University. And it's important to understand that Morgan was founded in 1867. Thus, the sesquicentennial that Nancy was uh, stumbling over, we all stumbled. It took us about five or seven years to learn to pronounce it. And that's when Morgan turned 150 in 2017. Um, initially, it opened as a training school or a seminary for African-American men in Methodist church ministry. And it has since grown into a urban public research university. So there's the uh, commercial for Morgan, if anyone should choose to report me back. Uh, so I want to discuss very briefly Victorine E. Quill's Baltimore. She was a native Baltimorean. Um, in 1912, the year Victorine Adams was born, there were 61 African Americans lynched that year. She was born 47 years after the end of chattel slavery with the passage of the Emancipation Act proclamation and 16 years after the United States Supreme Court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson which declared the doctrine of uh, separate but equal. And I call it the blurry lines of African-American citizenship gained greater focus in the 20th century. Victorine's generation will be the first efficient steward filled with race pride and impelled to act or to, uh, impelled to action for coming generations. So when you think about this, she's born in 1912, over 100, almost 112 years ago um, in terms of that. And so I just wanted to understand the world in which she was conceived in the Baltimore in which she lived. So that being said, it's uh, the nature and nurture aspects uh, are very important in terms of crafting personality and destiny. So for Victorine Quill, Baltimore was the best incubator for this pioneering destiny. Because even though it was a hard segregated line along race, as well as white ethnic groups and other groups, it was a place where you could be affirmed as a person. So even though there was hard levels of segregation, she had no issue with personality or confidence because she was in an environment that incubated and encouraged her sense of self-esteem. So according to Cynthia Neverdon Morton, a retired professor from Coppin, blending Northern and Southern characteristics, Baltimore represented confusing inconsistencies. There are, as throughout the South, Jim Crow laws created two separate worlds which could only meet when the meeting was essential to whites. So that becomes a matter of economy and employment. Uh, education was separate. Uh, churches were separate. So there were literally two worlds growing parallel at that time in which she was coming along. Here are some pictures from her collection, and they're very clear of the segregated life and the simplicity of that life. On the left of your screen is the James T. Dorothy. Um, I believe he's an equip operator of some sort here. I used to be able to see that. Um, but so you see that this is a black business, and he looks like he's probably in um, auto mechanic as such. And then you see over here to the right a group called the School Marm, M A R S, M A R M S, the School Marm. So here she is, pictured once again in the middle with these other young women who were school teachers at the particular time. So I'm, I'm not going to go that deep into that life. I really want to talk about her, the, how she becomes. Victorine Quill Adams. The E comes from the State Archives, so it's Victorine Elizabeth Quill. 
That is her birth name. I've never seen her use the E, so she always used the Q, but her official name was Victorine Elizabeth Quilt before she marries in 1935 to Willie Adams. So she is Victorine Q. Adams. She is now a school teacher, club woman, voter education advocate, boutique manager, and politician. Here she is at the age of five months. And I think I saw Rob Schoberlein, my fellow archivist in the audience, and of course we would be very discouraged with these pin pricks, but apparently there in the corners it was posted somewhere with a thumbtack. But this staged image is a very middle class value in 1912 of the first child born to her parents. Very adorable. She died at the age of 93, so she was very intentional about documenting her own life history. Here she is with her brother. She did have a brother, William, and he did have some children. She herself did not have children. It's funny, this piano bench that they're sitting on, we had one my, in my family as well with the, the claws and the balls. Those are very quite nice. And so here she is at the age of five, and her brother is three. So we now can leap to her adult years at Morgan State. She is a Morgan State graduate. She graduates from Morgan State College in 1940. It's important to notice the number of women in this class. She also obtained a teaching certificate from Coppin Normal School in the 1930s. Here she is with the orange star on her right shoulder. The class is nearly 50 plus people and there are less than 20 men in this photograph. So this is the advent of World War II. And so you're gonna find a bursting number or plethora of women matriculating through Morgan State majority during the 1940s and late 30s. Interestingly enough, what she's going to do is she's going to go into the field of teaching, and that's going to be a very prominent place because Coppin Normal School was created by the state of Maryland to give African-American women certification to teach. They did not want to integrate the University of Maryland College Park. So separate entities were created, such as Bowie State, which predates Morgan in 1865. That was to be for teachers. They eventually leave Baltimore City and move down to Prince George's County but it was principally Coppin State Normal School where a number of women from that generation, and when it was a two-year school, matriculated to get their teaching certification. So the feminine profession. African-Americans had a challenged history with education, both legally and logistically. Uh, the end of slavery flung open the doors to education. Victory's generation benefited from the zeitgeist of the 19th century desire, which was education because it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read. I'm sure we're familiar with Frederick Douglass and his narrative and having to kind of find ways to learn to read. So it's no surprise that African-Americans viewed education as an essential aspect of middle-class value. And the Quills were no exception. They believed in education. I don't have the history of her parents' education. I know that her mother came from the Eastern Shore. So it's very interesting to see what that would have looked like for her coming from an agrarian space into an urban center. So to that end, there were four feminized or pink collar professions that most women aspired to during that generation. A school teacher, a librarian, a social worker, and nurse were very attracted to women, educated women to go into to work. And in Baltimore, teaching was a desirous goal because that benefited the entire community. And second to that would be nursing or medicine. So the idea is that education would then lift the entire race and lift everyone, both parent and child, out of the darkness of ignorance as well as empowering them to be greater citizens. I love this picture here. And this all these pictures are from her collection here at Morgan State. This is her 1930s classroom. So you can see that the taller of the two is Victorine in the back. She was very petite. And I, she's a full adult at this point. So you see one of her students, nearly three quarters her height. So it's very interesting. And once again, these pin pricks in the corner uh, very concerning, but like I say, the picture existed and it survived. And it's, I guess, nearly 90 years old at this juncture. Um, also, you can read a lot in terms of the, the students being fed in the classroom and then how intimate the classroom is. All these children are African-American in this classroom. So Victorine was an activist. Uh, she, along with veteran activist Lily Carroll Mae Jackson, Ms. Jackson was the uh, president of the Baltimore NAACP and also known as the mother of the model civil rights movement. She innovated nonviolent tactics against racism in Baltimore. 
So this is an endeavor by the civic leaders for the Red Cross. Here is Victorine Adams. This is Willard Allen, who was a, an insurance salesman and a board of trustee member at Morgan, and also the most worshipful Grand Master of the Maryland Prince Hall Masons. And then you have Lily Carol Jackson over here. It's been my desire to try to identify these other persons in the photograph. And I know some persons with longer Baltimore memory than mine could very well help me to identify these people. But these are gonna be the movers and shakers of that 1930s, 40 era in Baltimore City. And so I found it very interesting that she is such, once again, a diminutive person in such a space with movers and shakers in Baltimore City. She was also into philanthropy and social activism in other areas. So this is another image from her collection, and it's uh, from the Democratic Women. This is the caption on the back, which I'll show you. They were entertaining the Baltimore Bullet and honoring them for their integration policies. I'm not a sports historian, but my uncle Ralph is, and he said the Boston Celtics were the first to bring a colored person onto the end of um, NBA. But the Baltimore Bullets must have been close to the second or third in the 1950s, the 50s to bring into the ranks a African-American player. So we do have names for this. From left to right is Ruth Turner, Zelma Johnson, Ada Smith, Victorine Adams, and uh, Tim Hawkins, and MC pictured also as Dr. Barksdale. And we'll see on the back the caption. So here's Victorine with the orange star. And I'm assuming these tall gentlemen must be players uh, on, on the team. So I love this because she did take an effort to Captured it. And that's where I read the Democratic women entertain the Balto Bullets, honoring them for their integration policies, pictured all those individuals. And then very clearly, I cannot recall all the names of the players. So that's being very frank. And once again, you see a lot of wear and clearly some mounting on the back of the photograph, but it survived and we have that information there. Then she was also into leisure. Her husband, Willie Adams, purchased land in. Um, the Eastern Shore area, and Body Beach, and he called it Elktonia Beach. And Elktonia Beach was a private, segregated beach for African Americans. Once again, everything in the Jim Crow age was parallel, so there were white and black versions of most everything. And since African Americans were not welcome in Ocean City, or a variety of other spaces where whites would summer, they created their own beaches. And so Elktonia Beach was where they purchased the land and they would use for summering activities, these pictures have such movement to them, and you just feel like you're actually with them in the water. So here is Victorine, and I believe this is a cousin of hers in the back, and other uh, classmates and friends. Uh, on the right-hand side is here she is, another orange star, next to her mother-in-law. She says on the back, Claudia Black is listed as Willie Adams' mother. So these are friends, family, and other African Americans who are summering at Eltonia Beach, and they just made it a um, space. Uh, they reserved the space in, um, I don't want to say Annapolis, but in the southern uh, shore there, where they actually have now made that land a, a park, a state park that cannot be violated with any kind of commercial buildup. Those of you, I really want to pull her from the shadows of her husband, Willie Adams. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but for those who are unfamiliar with him, he was a transplant from North Carolina to Baltimore City in the 1930s. Um, he was a very brilliant and talented person who never had the luxury of going to school formally because he came from an agrarian background. So picking cotton and other kinds of farming is what he had to do. So school was not a principal option as he was raised by his grandparents because his mother and his father, I don't believe were married and therefore left a strain on his grandparents. So he had to help out. He, when his grandmother dies, he eventually leaves his grandfather and migrates during that great migration period to Baltimore City East Side, by the way and uh, makes a way of running numbers because he had a photographic memory. So he was able to become a numbers runner and greatly increase his capacity for wealth. And as he grew in wealth, he was able to purchase property and uh, called again, ground rent and other spaces around the city to be able to do very well for himself. And as he becomes rather popular in his numbers running and then his legitimate businesses, he's going to eventually court athletes and entertainers. So this is Willie Adams here in profile. And I think we all might know this face. This is a, a very, very young Muhammad Ali. And I had a pleasure meeting with the Nation of Islam. And uh, the brother told me who all these men were and who the photographer was. Because this was a Nation of Islam photograph and a Nation of Islam photographer. 
And so I really appreciated him sharing those names with me. Of course, I didn't write it down for this presentation, but I do have them. And then on this much earlier picture, here's a very, very young Billy Holiday in the middle here at the Club Casino, which Willie Adams opened. So Club Casino, I believe, is on Pennsylvania Avenue in one of your kind of uh, nighttime adult spaces. And then there's a pugilist here, Henry Morgan. And so there are and these other two persons. I don't know this couple here or this woman here, but this is, once again, all the images from the collection. They're very rich photographs where they tell a part of Baltimore life that's not captured in the words of the Afro-American or in the common knowledge unless you live during that era. So from the 30s to the 60s, you're going to see all this happening in her collection. Another point of interest is that she was a school teacher. She taught in segregated schools. Maryland did not ratify the 19th Amendment till 1941. And that's very interesting. They were along the lines of Southern states that really did not want to enfranchise Black women. They did not vote on the ratification of 1958. So in response to the 1941 ratification, Victorine started the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee. And the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee sought to educate colored women on the vote. What is the ballot? Why should we vote? What does that mean? She even bought a machine so they could actually engage the physical device of pulling levers and doing all the manual things that go along with voting during that time period so there'd be no hesitation or fear. She would meet with them in their house. So here we have a candidate, Phil Goodman, who was uh, Philip Goodman, who was running for an office, who was coming to the home of Victorine Adams to engage her Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee and really pressing him on what his agenda would do for their community. You weren't just simply going to have our vote. We want to be able to engage the candidate and make sure that their agenda will meet our needs. And here she is in the corner once again by an orange star. So Goodman was a member of the Senate, Maryland Senate, in Baltimore City from 1955 to 1960. He was led, elected to the Baltimore City Council, um, president of the city council, and became the mayor of Baltimore in 62. And this image is from the Clinton studio. All this is the metadata, or what we call the caption material, on the reverse of the photograph. And these are members of her Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee. She also believed in the youth. So she was also seeking to kind of um, blaze a trail forward, but also do lateral work with her contemporaries, and then also do the longitudinal work of bringing youth along. So she had skating parties. So the skating party for junior registration cups, sponsored by the Democratic women, and Park Sausages. Here is Harry Park. Those of you may or may not know who he is. He was an independent businessman out of Ohio who had been a friend of the um, Joe Lewis. And Joe Lewis introduced him to Willie Adams. And so he had this great idea of this pig farm that was being sold in the North, and he wanted to basically go into the sausage business. Uh, once again, during the era of Jim Crow, African Americans did not have the luxury of walking into a bank to get a loan. Actually, contemporarily, they can really do that as well. So Har what Willie Adams did was that he became the collateral for Parks. And it's my understanding in one reading that he either took either Seventy-five or eighty-five thousand dollars, and put into a, a briefcase, and went to the bank and said, "Here's your cash. Give him the loan. If he defaults, you already have your cash." And that's how Park Sausages got started. Had I known, I loved Park Sausage when I ate that kind of meat years ago. The spicy was the best. But here is Henry Park, who will be a businessman and politician and friend of the Adams family. And then here is Victory to Adams with the young people. I would love to know the names of some of these young people. Clearly, this is the 1950s, 60s, and they might still be around, if not maybe their children. I don't have names for these individuals. So um, once again, to my colleague, Rob Schoberlein, oh, the, wear, the, the, the tearing of the pictures is, is, is heartbreaking. But at least we have the image and we have the context. So that's exciting. And all children were encouraged to ring doorbells and get out and vote. So she was getting them to be civically minded in terms of a stewardship of democracy not just simply waiting for someone, but also being engaged in the process. Chuck Richard was awarded a prize for the talent contest. Free refreshments and free admission were offered to all people. So along the lines of the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee, by the late 1950s, she's going to morph into another group called Women Power Incorporated. And this is a page from her scrapbook. Uh, and it says here at the bottom, Women Power Leaders, Mrs. Victorine Adams, left. And then Ethel Rich, co-chairman of Women Power, 
Uh, women hold registration, voter registration, and they met at the Sheraton Belvedere that month. It's believed to be that that meeting at the Sheraton Belvedere in 58 was the first integrated event they had at that hotel. So this woman here, Ethel Rich, is actually a social worker who worked at Providence Hospital, and so they had a great affinity for reaching out to the community. Now, I think most of us might know who this gentleman is here, but this is Mayor Schaefer, under which Victorine served as a city council person. In her collections, the proclamation declaring a particular day, Women's Power Inc. Day. So William Schaefer, governor, not governor, Mayor Schaefer at the time, was very keen on who she was. Uh, just a side note, I had the pleasure of meeting Mary Pat Clark, who was a councilman during the same era as Victorine Mutcher Jr., would say how Schaefer would refer to her and another one by the name of Barbara McCulkey, who was also on the city council, as a council girl. He never referred to Mrs. Adams as such. He would always call her councilman, councilwoman Adams, whereas the others he was rather dismissive and derogatory by calling them city council girls. And I believe it was because of the sharp, large shadow of Willie Adams behind Victorine that made him somewhat cower. But we know where Barbara Mikulski ended up. Uh, I mean, a remarkable career starting out as a social worker, one of those feminized professions, and seeking to change the policy to impact our field to the level of policy on the national level. So very interesting relationship there. So then what happens? She goes from being a teacher in the 30s, 40s, to this idea of a political voting rights educator, then she realizes, what well, I just run for office as well. So here in the 1960s, she's going to run for the city council, although she was in the state senate initially in 66, but when she realized there were two other black women at that level, but nobody was in the city of Baltimore, she said, let me go to the city. So here is one of her campaign brochures from the collection, and their thing was MAP. Michael Adams Park, vote for the MAP ticket, City Council 4. And once again, this pulling of the levers was part of the machine she had. And then we see this name here for Mayor, D'Alessandro. And for those of us who don't know, that would be the family of now uh, Speaker for Life, as they call her, Nancy Pelosi. So it's very interesting to see this kind of overlapping element of all of that in terms of Victorine's life. So we have here the reverse side of the campaign brochure where they spell out who each individual is, what they've committed themselves to do, and how they seek to make the city a better place. And so at the end of the day here, I think it's very interesting, when you look at campaign literature now, people aren't so quick to identify their religious affiliation or some of the other things they did, but they're very open about their church activism in this particular era of politics, as well as their successes and their accomplishments and then there are other organizations they affiliate with. So here we have you know, the idea of helping to solve neighborhood problems and being interested in unemployment and underemployment. That's huge because he was an employer. She eventually, when she gets elected, will also help create and bring projects to the city to raise employment and underemployment issues. And then also, I, bet, I met someone who I think is her niece or grandniece who also sought to use the idea of bringing jobs to the city. Because at this time period, a lot of factory work, a lot of manual labor was leaving the city, creating small, if not growing, underclass populations who did not have skills that could translate into modern work, but they still desired to work. So I found this to be very interesting as well. So then she becomes elected in 1967 to the city council. She is the first African-American woman to serve on the city council as an elected officer. And then she's going to start to once again bring this voting rights education, voting registration consciousness to that city level to help other generations of young women. I love this here with the Women's Fair, Women Together, January 22, 1975, best decade ever of the 20th century, if you ask me. But nevertheless, putting herself in a space to identify younger women to go into politics, to go into city service or civic service. Then this gentleman here, another mentee, a very familiar face, that is Kwaese and Fume. I believe it might have been Frizzell Jackson at that time and has become Kwaese and Fume. But he was one of her uh, kind of mentees as well. So it went from just simply encouraging women to looking at those who are outside of the bail of politics to consider the work and voting rights and education. So here is a check for $21,000. And this is for the Baltimore 
Fuel Fund Incorporated. And so what happened in 1978 along the eastern seaboard, for those of us who are here might remember, there was the blizzard of 78. And that literally shut down the eastern seaboard. I remember elementary school, we did not have to go to school for I don't know how many days. It seemed like forever school was closed. And uh, it really caused great disaster in terms of heating and climate. What happened in Baltimore City, from my understanding and my reading, is that some people who had been on the fringes of losing their utilities were cut off. And in the midst of being cut off from their utilities, they eventually used alternative fueling or heating sources that led to fire as well as death. And being a, a moral and Catholic person, she was appalled by that. Victory was appalled by that. So she created the Baltimore Fuel Fund Incorporated, which was a public-private partnership to bring together money to help subsidize those individuals who were in arrears with their utilities. And I believe one economist had said that the amount of arrears were two to three hundred dollars. They weren't thousands of dollars in debt. They were small pools of money that they owed to be able to pay for their heat utility. We have now since passed legislation, I believe nationally, that persons cannot have their utilities cut in the midst of a crisis. This pandemic has shown us some other kinds of ideas of morality, but that's a conversation for another time. So she created all kinds of gimmicks to raise the money. Paddles for the people. So there were paddle boat races and once again, an advertising for the fuel fund. Her husband, a very wealthy entrepreneur, put some of his money in the midst of it as well. So it was a public private partnership to help people pay their bills. And this is a very dashing picture of her in that 1970s period. I love this image as well. Another uh, image from her collection. I had one gentleman called a rose among thorns. And uh, now this one, actually, I had to get someone to identify the kid is. And I want to thank Senator Mitchell for being very helpful to helping me identify these people who I do not know, but he helped me. So Loyal Randolph here uh, was a delegate, and it was my understanding from Larry Gibson, preeminent Baltimore everything guy, uh, that he was her mentor politically. She really esteemed him in terms of how he moved politically, and he mentored her. That victory was mentored by Loyal Randolph. Then there's Larry Young, John Jeffries, Senator Michael Bowen Mitchell, Abner Lee, Clarence Mitchell III, Ray Haysbert, Willie Adams, and Sterling Page. So I believe this is my man Haysbert, who was very much in response to the forum caterers. I think he just recently, someone in his family recently passed away. But nevertheless, this is Willie Adams, her husband, and then, of course, Sterling Page. So these are the men and women that are used to be men that held position in the city and in the state and were very supportive of her, most likely because of him, but also she was effective in her doing as well. So when we look at her legacy, and I'll, this is my last slide, to kind of look at her life in Baltimore, uh, Victorine Adams speaks truth to power through her archival collection in particular. I did not know who she was. And the appeal was during this 150th for Morgan. But in doing more research about her, we were in this, the same sorority. And I was living in Washington, D.C. She's in Baltimore. Our paths crossed, but I never knew who she was. And I thought it would be very tragic because she lived contemporaneously with me. It wasn't like she was 18-something. She was 1990s, the 2000s. I was here in this area and had known about her. So I really felt compelled to have her her words speak for themselves, to revive her and put her where she belongs in the contemporary memory of Baltimore City. Her intentional activity sought to situate her life along with other women through documenting every aspect of her life. The pictures record mundane activities, voter education sessions, international travel, leisure moments, and businesses throughout the Black community or Black Baltimore. The documents and artifacts check charts the changes in Baltimore's political landscape from wards, 16 wards in the city to 14 districts, the structure and the membership of the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee and Women Power Incorporate, Incorporated provide a blueprint for successful club activity. Ultimately, she understood the numinous or the emotional aspects of knowing the past. So she knew at the age, or her parents probably saved it and gave it to her, the five-month-old picture 
her five-year-old picture. And I mean, there's thousands of pictures in her collection that chronicle her life. She was impelled to share, empowering rising generations and an opportunity to reach further and to do more. So I believe that is her legacy. And it's my understanding that I believe current Speaker Jones and former Mayor Catherine Pugh were members of Women Power Incorporated. So I want to thank you for your time. This is my contact information. If you want to take a picture of the screen and we can talk more about Morgan's collection, or we gladly can have some conversation going into this now that I've finished my presentation. Thank you for your time. And once again, thank you, Baltimore Heritage Area and the PS. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Wow. Um, like you, I just feel like, how did I not know about this woman before? Um, I, I'd like to ask you to start the uh, Q&A session by maybe speaking to that. Why, why do amazing people like Victorine Adams just fall off of our radar? That's a very good question. I think it's just a glut of information that's out there. She never thought to make herself know. She was working for the community and the people. She was very clear in her archival collection how important she was, but she never promoted herself as such. She believed in the we-ness of it all. So it was we, the community, we, the Baltimoreans, regardless of race, gender, or class, us moving forward. So I think in the idea of her being so inclusive that it just falls off the radar because she's not there to be the glue anymore. And no one's promoting her because she left structures in place that can be self-promoting. Mm -hmm. The fuel fund still goes on to this day. And there are other states that have picked up this idea of a fuel fund because of the Maryland model that was started by Victory. So I think that's part of it. She did not seek to make herself grandiose. So as a result, people didn't think about it. Yeah, and I'll have to say that resonates for me a little bit about um, perhaps how women were raised to be which was not self-promoting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe things have changed a little bit in the era of social media, but uh, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate because it does take then scholars and historians like you to excavate that that past and bring the, their good work back to our attention. Could you maybe talk, we've got a, a question in the chat about the collection of photos that seems to have been such an important um, resource for you. Uh, in your research. Where did you find those? Yeah, I really have to applaud Victorine posthumously. Uh, she was very intentional from my understanding from one of the librarians who was here during her uh, depositing time that she brought them herself. But the fact that she took so many, I even contacted, I guess, the Phillips family, another Black family that was very noted in the photo photograph, and they basically told me that um, she purchased everything that was taken of her. So the grandson of the great grandsons in charge of the family photograph, and he was explaining to me that, yeah, I think she has everything, but you're willing to look at what I have. But she was very intentional about documenting herself and ensuring that she had what she needed. So I, the collection is extremely rich with the photographs. That even we had a visitor from the state capitol to come to look for the Eltona photograph because they have no images of that beach. They know about it. They've heard about it. They understand the dimensions of it, but they had no images from that time period. So they came in, there are hundreds of pictures of her at that beach. So they had a golf course, they would have, and divide, uh, there was a baby contest, there was of course a beauty contest. Uh, they had radio hosts, I mean, Ella Fitzgerald would go out there. So they had national inter entertainment out there, radio station out there that would kind of cover the activities on the beach. So they had all that resident in the photograph. Wow. So, and of course there's people that I don't know because there's no captions. And I mean, just fabulous 1950s, you know, images. Everyone was pretty apparently back then, you know. I don't know what, what we call ourselves now, but very stylish. <laughs> and so as a result, you have all these images of varying stages of community that she kept. And uh, like I said, except for the pin prick, they're great images. Yeah, they are. And the clothes are fabulous, I just have to say. <laughs> they're very dashing, very, yeah, very dashing. Yeah. Um, Shantae, why do why do you think that Victorine's story is still relevant today, and and what compelled you to invite Dr. Jones to give this talk today? Well, I think the most important thing is that there are so many people that have done great work in Baltimore that are 
not recognized or people don't know about them. And I think that um, what happened with Victor Rain's, um, with Dr. Jones's book is um, my office colleague brought the book at a women's heritage um, event. And she brought it in and she sit it on my desk and she goes, I think you should read this. This is very interesting. Um, and she knows that I'm always looking for um, the unknown stories in Baltimore. I had never heard of Victorine until that book. And so I started going through the book and looking at um, her connections with other organizations. Um, I'll, and I have to tell you this, I just want to announce the the elephant in the room. Um, it was odd to me that she was married to Willie, um, to Willie, because he has a very checkered past. If you read um, the um, uh, Not In My Neighborhood book, um, Willie is was a gentleman that believed in by any means necessary, am I going to lift myself up? And so when I found out that Victorine was married to him, I was like, whoa. But that, you know, she appeared to be a woman that was her own woman. He was just a, he, he was just a partner. She was out to change the way that our children um, in Baltimore were treated, how they were educated. And so you have to give her her own respect. She's not just Willie Williams. Uh, was it Williams? Will, little Willie. He, little Willie Adams' wife. She was her own person. So um, I'm always looking for women that um, are trying to um, do for themselves, um, but they are also lifting other people up while they do for themselves. So that's why Victorina is like, um, a, you know, a mini idol in my, uh, in my, in my, in my catalog. And you've brought so many people like that to our attention through this series. Thank you again for that. Um, Dr. Jones, is there anything that you came across in your research that you didn't have time to include in this talk, but that you'd like to just flag and maybe plant the seed for a future talk about more aspects of this story? Yeah, thank you for that. When I finished processing the collection, I was happy that the book came out as well. So that was to me was a, a done deal. So as I'm going through the collection here, being the inaugural archivist at Morgan, there were five boxes that had just brown boxes, no identifications, no labels. And they were full of what? Victory Adams material. So apparently there were constituency letters and other kinds of things from her administration for the four terms she sat on the council. And some of those letters are very moving um, in light of how the, archives are growing. I haven't had the luxury to go back to them, but there's an appendix to the collection of at least another three feet of material that need to be gone through. So there should be some more conversation about what she did legislatively. I was looking at her, the person, and her, the teacher, and her, the politician, but people were more concerned about her legislation. What does that look like? What laws did she help pass in the city? And so um, I haven't gone through them yet, <laughs> but they're there. And I think that's a, a conversation that needs to be had. Another conversation of note is that she was married for 70 years to Willie Adams. They were they both lived into their 90s, and he she predeceased him. However, um, he admired her for her education because she eventually does go, I believe, to Columbia or somewhere in New York University and gets a certificate in business. He bought the um, charm shop, so she had a, a boutique, a couture dress shop on Pennsylvania Avenue. That, of course, the Billie Holidays and Ella Fitzgeralds would go and shop in. I met one woman who was a student here at Morgan who went to get her debutante cotillion dress there and just remarked about how being invited into this space as a young woman was what she'd heard about. You know, the, the carpet shag was so deep. She, like, sank in the carpet shag. And it was like this uber feminine, uber space that just blew her away because she's in her 80s reflecting back being 15 or 16 as a young woman and buying that gown from that particular shop and just the treatment and the kind of who these women were. And um, that I could just watch her eyes as Miss Smith was recounting this and kind of going through her eyes to see what that must have been like. So he bought the shop for her called the Charm Center and that's where she ran her business selling boutique and couture fashions. 
At the same time, at night, she would hold her meetings there for the Democratic Campaign Committee. And then she'd also teach shops to young women, high school, and yeah, I guess what you call middle school, on dress and deportment. Um, and there's some language in her collection about what colors to wear in terms of lipstick and what kind of slips, girdles, bras. I mean, these are other practical things that we don't think about in terms of how young women become women. And she was very much instrumental in helping them get that together. And uh, through her shop, the Charm Center. So there was a lot more she was doing in a granular aspect for the community. And that I think needs to be brought out some more. So I think we're missing, we're missing some of those leaders now or some of those individuals who did that. Uh, Cause a lot of the young people are just kind of randomly out there like weeds growing wild. So there's no real investment in them collectively to kind of keep the guardrails on and kind of go straight, whatever straight looks like for you and kind of just get certain things under your belt before you start to kind of do other things. So. I would which um, I don't mean to interrupt, but which also speaks to the the history of Pennsylvania Avenue. And, you know, I have I, I'm not definitely not old enough, but I'm very nostalgic. And so there's it, you're you're kind of torn between two worlds. You are torn between, you know, about the racism and the segregation and all of those things and all of those things. But on the other side. Um, black people thrived in their community. They lifted one another up. They had cotillions. They had debutante balls. They had social clubs. And I, that's the nostalgia in me. I always look at that and say, what would it have been like to get dressed in a formal, not just for your prom, but you're going to be uh, introduced um, to society. And before being introduced to society, you were taught what fork to use and what uh, what all of these uh, utensils at the table setting mean. Um, that is the kind of thing that um, I think Dr. Jones was alluding to about our young people don't know these things. People go to restaurants now and they don't know what fork to use. They'll use any fork or having the proper, uh, what, what's, what's the proper, uh, uh, I guess, where, to a semi-formal as versus a formal uh, and what's business wear. And, you know, we have gotten just generally um, as a people have gotten more relaxed anyway, um, because I know that there were days when women, a woman would never leave the house without her lipstick on and without her dress on or her girdle. Um, and I just, and I, and I hate to say that, but that's the way my grandmother was. They wouldn't leave the house and you leave the house now with, you know, looking with our sweatpants on, they were like, where are you going? And I just, that reminds me of Pennsylvania Avenue and the charms, uh, the charm center and all of the businesses that were aligned there. So there is just a wealth of knowledge that lives in West Baltimore of how people live their lives, even through the, the racism and the um, oppression. And to Miss Henry's point, Miss Henry's been blowing up the chat here and I thank her for that. She's kind of co-signing on a lot of it in terms of not being able to wear pants, which I believe at most schools and lot HBCUs, they could not wear pants uh, outside of the dorm. So one of my friends who was a Howard graduate would roll her under her trench coat, pull up her pajama bottom so they couldn't see that she was wearing pants and keep her trench coat on. But um, and I know some of that is rather old hat and I understand things have to modernize. But I think if you have some classical standards, it's to your advantage, then you know how to freestyle. But I think it's become so obtuse that people don't know what to do. And so there are some some issues there. And I was trying to get back. Oh, so the, back to her politics. So with the Colored Women's Democratic Campaign Committee, women, she has a, a manual in the collection on how they are to dress and comport themselves. And then they're to go to these city council meetings. And, they, and she says the script is if you're asked the question, say Miss or Mrs. Name, voter, registered voter. And she told them, do not take notes with a pen and paper because people stop to talk when you're taking things down like that. Try to take as much as you can in your head so they can talk freely and then bring that back to the group and we'll discuss it in greater detail. So she was very strategic in that regard and women got paid to go. So if you couldn't go, you had to tap somebody else in to go for you. But they were paid to go to these meetings to sit and listen and reconnaissance and bring things back. And a lot of it had to do with schools in terms of um, in that West Baltimore area where they were opening schools or 
school safety. She was very clear that they wanted certain policies to be in place, pay equity for black teachers, a lot of different agenda items. So she was very clear with those women how to go to these meetings and present themselves. And for African-American women in particular of that era, you're talking the 40s and the 50s, it's called respectability. So you had to dress a certain way to be taken seriously, even if you were domestic or even if you did not have, quote, a formal education. You still had to comport yourself accordingly. And so she's very clear on that and no slip showing and no this and no that. And so I think sometimes that that was very helpful to kind of conform to the expectations of society so that you weren't having to have anything to say, I'm being rejected because of this. I look like everybody else. I sound like everybody else. Why can't I attain? And so that thing about taking notes was very interesting. So she was very clear. Do not take out any paper. Do not take any they'll freeze their conversation or feel hesitant in their conversation. And uh, they were very successful in kind of taking it in their head and bringing back the who and the what of those conversations. Amazing. I do want to just, uh, we've got a few minutes left here for further questions. I do want to encourage anyone who would like to um, speak up. You're welcome to turn your mics off, uh, back on, uh, unmute and um, ask them, by voice or put them in the chat. Um, this being Smaltimore, of course, I couldn't help but notice all the ways that your work, Dr. Jones, um, is relevant to and, and kind of intersecting with some things that we've done at the Peel. Um, and I was very happy to see um, uh, Dr. Brian Morrison join us, who worked with us on the exhibit called Education Will Be Our Pride about the Peel when it was male and female colored school number one. Now this was 19th century, so 1878 to 89. Um, but I'd love to think about the ways that Victorine's history with education kind of expands that um, narrative into the 20th century. Our um, storyteller in, re in residence, Mama Linda Goss, uh, did some work at the same time that Dr. Morrison and Tanika Berkeley and others were working on the colored school history. And she is a graduate of uh, segregated schools and talked about how she felt like the quality of education when the schools were segregated in many cases was higher um, than post-integration. I see Dr. Morrison's raised his hand. Maybe he wants to to chime in on that topic and love to hear your response too, Dr. Jones. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm tardy for the party, but I, I, and just as I jumped in, uh, Dr. Dr. Jones was, was mentioning about the women going to the meetings and, and taking notes on the meetings, and a lot of those meetings were, uh, had to do with issues of education. Um, so I, I'm, and the first thing that came into my mind was I, I wonder what it was that, what were some of those issues that they were reporting back on? The next phase of my research goes into um, the colored school system and the post-Brown years. So I'm, I'm sort of curious, Dr. Jones, if you could share uh, any further insights as to um, what kinds of educational issues specifically uh, the women were reporting on if if you have if you have anything on that I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. They were principally concerned about the schools, the physical structures. We now call it sick building syndrome or what have you. So a lot of the schools did have detrimental health hazards in the building. Uh, clearly, this is the 1950s, so it's not going to have the kind of technology or expectations of now. But they were sick building. And so the idea of rebuilding and or fixing the physical structures of the building, then also the location of the building. There was a one um, case where they wanted to open up a school somewhere and it was like between two bars or something. And it are, are a very uh, vile adult space. And they said the children should have to step over, you know, drunken corpses to, uh, to get to school. So the idea of locating the schools, fixing the schools was huge during that time period. The post Brown period would happen is dynamic black teachers are taken out of the school and sent to the county. And then they're replaced by subpar individuals of both colors. So the idea that the brain drain happened where the teachers that were very brilliant, dynamic, and dedicated 
were literally siphoned off to the county really led to the implosion of the school mm. system. That's not to indict everybody who's teaching as a bad teacher, but it definitely did shift the, the temperature in the, the field of education in that time period. You know, the other thing that I'd love to maybe record you uh, telling some more focused stories on is, is about her interaction with Baltimore's mayors. Um, we're actually doing a tour now of um, the mayor portraits that are in City Hall and um, working with Matt Crenson on that. Um, but it would be wonderful to, as part of that tour, have links out to information about other people, as it were, some of the women behind those mayors who were almost until recent history, all men. I'm not sure if Dr. Morrison had a follow-up to the statement I was saying. And then I'll gladly answer your question. I was. Uh, no, that that was that was that was that. I've mean, okay, <laughs> got a lot okay. more questions, but but okay. yes, that was that was that was that was sort of where where my head was because the similar issues were still in my earlier research in African American education in the in the eighteen hundreds. Those were similar kinds of issues that they that they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I am curious about the um, the brain drain to the to Baltimore County uh, because that's where initially black teachers were able to teach out out in the county. That when Baltimore County opened up to its pub started its public education system, uh, black teachers that's the that's really the only places they could teach. They couldn't teach in the city, so they were in the outlying counties. Um, and it definitely was once um, Brown came into came into a into full force. It took a while because many, many, many people in the black community did not want to to integrate and go to the integrated schools. They wanted to stay in the black schools and stay with their black teachers because of the culturally responsive um, pedagogy that those teachers were practicing. But in any case, I'm a, I'm a bit curious about that that shift of teachers going out to uh, to Baltimore County and and um, how that occurred. But that's the further research down the road for me. Thanks for the for raising the question for me. No worries. I'll be reaching out to you anyway because I'm working on Frances Harper and I see you at the William Watson's Academy, which was her uncle. So I definitely be reaching out to you for the bicentennial of Frances Harper, the niece of William Watkins Harper. I mean, a preeminent educator in the 19th century. So we have lots yeah, of kind she, of yes. Yeah. And, and she taught at at uh, at his school. Yeah. She was a yeah. teacher there as well. Yeah. yeah so yeah, so education is key here. But to get back to your question about the mayors, she served under four for four terms on the council, and I believe she was friendly with all the mayors. Like I said, Schaefer, uh, because I have the lived experience of both Mary Pat Clark and to a lesser extent Barbara Mikulski, I've not spoken to her directly, but I have spoken to Mary Pat Clark about him being somewhat chauvinistic. Um, but she got along with everybody for the most part, whether it was the looming shadow of her husband that forced compliance or whether it was just simply her, her grace and tact, I don't know. But um, I believe Martin Mandel, and then um, D.L. Sandra, she was very close with him as well. And I know that in 1967 or 68, she was the Democratic National Committee's uh, LBJ booster for the state of Maryland. So she was very connected to the Democratic Party in terms of federal, state, and, and city government. So she was very dedicated to that idea. And when she retires, it's going to be Kirk Schmoke in 83 when she leaves office and um she was very affinity with him as well, because he's in that quite and Fume generation of young people that were being mentored or kind of inspired by her generation. So I don't have um, any concrete like quotes to share, but I can definitely go back and look in the collection to see the nature of the exchange. But from my understanding, what I've seen is very peaceful, pleasant relationships of professional uh, consideration and respect mm -hmm. in that particular thing with mayor and city council first. Well, with that, we have hit the top of the hour. Um, Shantae, would you like to uh, make any further comments or questions before we thank everybody and send them on their way? Uh, you're muted, Shantae. I'd like to thank Dr. Jones for being willing to take an hour, an hour and a half out of her life to present um, I'm not sure if she may want to let us know where her book is being sold. So if you, anyone wants to read more about Victorine, there is a wonderful book that was written um, through Morgan 
by Dr. Jones. So um, I want to say thank you to her. I want to thank the production team over at The Peel. The Peel is a great partner of ours. Um, and so they produce these programs for the benefit of the public. It is education to know where we came from and where we're going to and knowing these people. So I'm really proud about that uh, and thankful that we could bring these programs to you. The last thing I really want to tell you is um, on the 12th of April, it'll be our last program. And everyone knows about how um, Baltimore is turning into a incubator, a tech uh, hub, and people are coming here to think about starting their businesses and entrepreneurship. So on the 12th, our program is going to be um, uh, is John uh, Goldman from the BNO is going to look at Baltimore's relationship to maritime and the railroad. Two things that change the dynamics and the economy of Baltimore. So we have this wonderful opportunity to see that Baltimore reinvents itself every 50, 80, 100 years, and we become even greater and stronger economically. So um, I hope you will join us for that. That's on April the 12th, 12 noon, and there'll be lots of information about it coming your way um, in the weeks to come. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here today and um, have a great weekend. Oh, and by the way, it's Palm Sunday this Sunday. So um, all of those that go forth um, in, um, in the Christian way, have a wonderful Palm Sunday. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones and Shantae. And thank you also, Dr. Jones, for putting the link in the chat to the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. I was trying to put a link in the chat to places to buy your book that were not Amazon. Um, so, but uh, there are plenty of ways to get it. Also, I think there's a, an audio version now too. Is that right? I'm not sure I have to check. I don't know. I haven't had the time to check. I was incredibly searching here. I think I spotted that. So anyway, um, please do check out Dr. Jones' book. Please do sign up to uh, attend the April 12th lecture from Baltimore National Heritage Area. And if you enjoyed this program, you can support future such programs by making a donation through Baltimore National Heritage Area's website. We're just putting the link in the chat there. Just donate and uh, we'll keep all this great uh, brilliance and insight flowing. Thank you again to everybody.